Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tamara Studio. We decided to start a little bit early so we can test all the equipment and make sure everything works. So hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, did everybody find the chat box? Could you please send me a quick hello or something like that so I can see that you're all online and everything works? We will get started in just a minute. I have everything set up, guys. Hopefully you have your paints ready as well. We will, there will be a paint along today. It will be, you see the reference photo, I have it on my desk. So that's what we'll be working on and talking about art materials. So that should be a lot of fun. Make sure you have your water, your paper towels, all your brushes, everything set out. I saw a lot of good comments online. I see that I know that a lot of uh, people are, a lot of artists are, excited about this event. Me too, because, you know, I just enjoy talking to artists and getting some live feedback. You know, it's always interesting to hear from people in real time. So, all right, I see some comments are coming in. So people are watching. That's good. Okay, we have just one or two minutes before we start to give people a chance to set up and you know, log in and be ready to get started. If this is the first time you're on my channel, my name is Ksenia Anis. This is Tammy Rap Studio. You're seeing it live on your screen. I also have uh, my partner, Patrick Michelli, here with me. He's monitoring the chat stream. So don't hesitate to say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. Uh, I think we have quite an international audience here today. Uh, also, don't hesitate to post your questions as well. You know, maybe when you got the list of materials, you had some questions or when you were looking at the reference photo. So uh, Patrick is monitoring all your questions and I will stop from time to time during this live stream and I will be answering questions. It's not going to be like one Q&A session. I will try to answer them you know, so we're all on the same page. Answer them as soon as you type them in. Alrighty. Do you already have a question? No. No, we're good? All right. Patrick, what, What's our geography? We have anybody posting? Uh, Houston and Nicholasville, Kentucky. <laughs> All right. Or in Oregon, Oregon coast. Oh, wow. We have West Coast as well. Early in the morning there. Uh, yes, yeah, still early, but people are ready to paint. That's exciting. All right, guys, it's 11 a.m. We're going to start our live session, our paint along and Q&A. Uh, I created this event uh, to celebrate 5,000 sub subscribers on my YouTube channel, Learn to Paint with Ksenia Anis. And I know by YouTube standards, that's not a huge number by any means, but it's important for me, important threshold uh, that tells me that uh, I don't you know, waste my time creating all the videos that there are people who enjoy watching them and enjoy learning from them. And it's also a mutual process because I read all your comments and I see what people are interested in, what videos they react to. And it's just a great experience. I'm enjoying it very much. And I wanted to do something special to celebrate all the people who watch my channel and who subscribe to it. And special thanks to our information sponsor, Diane Zimmerman, who is the uh, 
administrator of a fabulous Facebook group uh, that's called Watercolor Beginners and Beyond. If you haven't checked it out yet, if you're on Facebook, I highly recommend it. There's, there is lots of interesting information there, great people. So if you want to uh, check that out as well, um, go to Watercolor Beginners and Beyond on Facebook. All right. So what are we going to do today? Let's talk about that. Um, I found this reference photo on Unsplash. You should uh, have this link, but it's fairly simple. If you want, if you don't have it printed out or anything, I think you can even uh, look, you know, kind of paint from uh, the screen image that you will see. I'll try to keep it in the shot. Uh, we will attempt to do this uh, painting. And I would like to do this painting in my uh, loose watercolor style as if you watched any of my videos or you saw my work uh, online, you will know that I'm not into kind of hyper-realistic detail painting. I just don't have the, the patience for it. Sometimes I do it, but for the most part, I prefer to work very loosely and kind of let watercolors flow and do their thing. And I know that a lot of people find that style very attractive, but a little bit hard to, um, to achieve, right? For some reason, we want to control the paint. We think that we need to control the paint, but there are certain things you can do uh, that will help you uh, with loose, to loosen up and to paint more loosely. And we will talk about these things today. Uh, the important thing for us to do will be to, I will show you how to start loosely but then how we can use opaque white to add details to our painting uh, and to make it realistic and to kind of, you know, make it look what it's supposed to look like. So we will analyze the reference photo. I will start painting and you can start painting along with me because it will be very simple. And um, after that, we will set our painting aside. We will need to let it dry. So for that pause, my plan was to talk to you about uh, materials, the opaque whites uh, or different white materials that I use uh, when I try to paint loosely with watercolor. I will show you some work examples as well. I have like a whole pile prepared right here and you will be able to see how those materials, how different they look and how I decide which one to use for different purposes for different subjects, right? Um, after, hopefully, during that pause, our painting will dry and we will finish our painting together. I will show you uh, how I introduce a pig white to finish the painting. So that's the plan. I'm thinking about an hour, right? Depending how many questions we have, uh, how things progress. Uh, so I also wanted to tell you guys, almost forgot, uh, if I don't answer all the questions during the live session, I will be reading them afterwards. So don't worry about it. I will respond to everybody. And also Tamirap Studio is on all social media. It's very easy to get in touch with me. Uh, after the session, I will send you some follow up emails. Uh, that's why we were asking everybody to register so you know we can interact with you. Uh, we will be sending you some um, uh, the link for the replay. If you forgot something or you had to step away from your computer, you'll be able to watch the replay of this video. And also we will send you a special uh, offer for the classes that I teach. So stick with me. Um, let's get started. Uh, let's look at our reference photo and um, let's kind of uh, formulate a plan for our painting. You know, when I started painting with watercolors, I thought you know, it's a kind of free flowing medium. I'll just jump in and see what happens. And it usually ended up in a disaster, right? So then I realized that I need to have a plan before I get started. So what are we going to do? So in this photo, I see all these different colors and I have some white areas on the photo, right? So how do we show white in watercolor? There are basically two ways. White can be the white of the paper, uh, which we can save by applying masking or by painting negatively around those areas. 
If you're not familiar with those methods, I have a class. It's called uh, From Zero to Watercolor Hero. It's meant for absolute beginners where I explain how to do this. But basically, I would apply masking to everything. That's why I will have to make an accurate drawing right first. Then I will have to apply masking, let it dry. Then I will paint with different colors, all those uh, lemon and orange slices. Then I will remove the masking. I will have white paper here and I might have to do some touch up to finish the painting. So that will be one way to do it. Another way would be, again, to make an accurate drawing and then paint very carefully just the color portions of all this fruit, right, with different colors, trying very hard to preserve this and this and this as white paper. This is called negative painting, which is a great technique, which requires a lot of time and patience, right? Uh, I'm kind of short on, <laughs> on both qualities, so the way I propose to approach this painting is to not do any preliminary drawing, throw some colors, <coughs> excuse me, throw some colors on paper, let it dry, and then use opaque white to paint all the white areas on top of our color wash. So that's what we will be doing today. And without Further ado, let's get started. Let me get my paper. I will be painting on cold press, 100% cotton watercolor paper. The weight is 140 pounds, it's 300 grams. Uh, this is a block that's glued on all sides. This is basically the only way to keep 140 pound paper from buckling. I see a lot of questions. Uh, if you use a pad, which is like loose sheets of uh, watercolor paper and people said, I pinned it, but it's still buckled. It will buckle. And even in the block, it will try to rip this glue and kind of warp, uh, but it's okay because once it dry, we have it, it will stretch back out again. So not to worry about it. Um, and I'll show you thicker paper a little bit later too, and we can compare the two. So here's my paper. I always use cold press. So if you're wondering, I don't use any other textures. I'm going to set it up at a slight angle. I have this handy little containers with watercolor ground that I'm going to use to give my paper a slight angle. And why am I doing this? because I want the colors to run down and mix. It's a lot easier to work with watercolor if you have a little bit of an angle. And also you can see better. I have the overhead lights, so once I start applying water, everything, there is glare, but this helps me to prevent that. I'll put the reference photo on this side. I wanna make sure you guys can see it. It will be right here. And I have my watercolors right here. I sent you all a list of colors, but like I said, don't worry about copying the exact pigments. You know, it's not the end of the world if you use Hansa yellow light instead of lemon yellow or something like that. Just see what you have on your palette. The important thing is to understand the principle. It's not about copying the colors, right? If you understand what you're doing, you can use any color and create your own artwork. You don't have to copy. All right. So to get started, I want to start painting wet on wet. That's very important because to create a loose watercolor wash, the best way to start is to wet the paper. And there are two ways to do it, right? We can just take a brush and put water on the paper. Or what I'm going to do is use this little spray bottle. It's fine mist. This paper is kind of on the thinner side, right? It's not 300 pounds, it's 140 pounds. Uh, so if I start applying water with a brush, my concern is that there will be too much water. This is kind of Goldilocks situation here, right? We want some water, but we don't want too much water. So um, I would adjust that according to the thickness of your paper. Just give it a good spritz. And 
And I'm also going to use a soft brush. I have this um, Heiko brush to kind of spread the water and make sure that I have my paper nicely prepared for my painting. And you guys can start doing this as well. You can already, I can already see, I don't know if you see it on the camera, you probably do. Yeah, it's already starting to buckle. Are we doing okay, Patrick, on the questions? Yes. Okay, everybody's good. All right. Uh, I'm going, I already spritzed my colors uh, this morning and I closed the lid, but I will do it again. Before you start painting, it's good to prepare your colors and just give them a light spritz. I'm, I'm only going to use the, the reds. I just give them a light spritz of water. No drawing, we don't need a drawing or anything, so don't worry about anything like that. I'm going to use a flat brush. This is a very inexpensive synthetic brush, flat brush. Important to have a flat brush because it picks up a lot more pigment than water. And it kind of seems counterintuitive, right? Because it's watercolor, we think we need water. We do need water to some extent, but we don't need a huge amount of water because that will wash out our colors and make it our watercolor very pale and we will want to apply more and more layers and watercolor will lose transparency. So let's get started. This um, main lemon, the, that's the center, um, he's kind of smack in the middle here but I'm going to offset it a little bit just for better composition. But you can move it even lower if you want to, so totally up to you. I'm starting with lemon yellow, applying lots of color, wash my brush after each color application, and let's keep moving with our free flowing and fun wash. This guy's the kind of orange I have, um, I always confuse them. This is Scarlet Lake. This is like Scarlet O'Hara. So this is Scarlet Lake. I'm mixing it with yellow, a new gamboge, uh, to make that this color. And it's going to be somewhere here. This one is going to be somewhere here. He might need a little more pink. This is opera pink. Throw this in. Where else we see opera pink? So this kind of looks like pink. Can use a little bit of orange in here as well. I'm going a little bit in a circular motion, but uh, I mean, I will uh, connect them all in just a second. It will be just a solid wash here. There's orange here, maybe thin it out a little bit. I use my palette to mix colors, but notice guys that I only have water on my brush. That's what I'm using, right? And some on the paper. Do not dilute this with extra water. It's not necessary. You can test pigments here, but Basically, I'm working with pigments straight out of the wells and I'm applying them on paper. The water on the brush, especially, I have a one inch brush, pretty big. So um, the water that's on the brush is enough to, for, paper, for a pigment to spread on paper. Okay, there is a yellow one. Let's apply our new gamboge here. And if the paint starts to dry, if you massage it kind of slightly with your brush, it will re-wet again because it will take a while for all this paint to dry completely. So I'm getting this very colorful, kind of slightly crazy wash that I'm having fun with and I'm not concerned about, you know, precision or staying within the pencil lines or anything like that. Maybe a little more lemon yellow here. The important thing is to wash your brush after each color application. That's the only thing. Uh, 
because otherwise you will contaminate your colors, right? And they will not be clean anymore. You can wash them out afterwards. It's no big deal, but just during painting process, it's kind of good to keep your um, colors as clean as possible. Let's see, what else do I want to do? I need to finish this top. So maybe this is Crimson Lake applied here just for variety kind of balance the two sides and maybe a little bit more new gamboge there is a yellow guy here and like i said guys if you don't want to paint you prefer to just watch you will have the replay link you can watch this again and then try it because sometimes it's better to just watch and not get distracted with painting all right this is my first wash it took me what maybe five minutes to complete right uh, i didn't have to do a painting or anything uh, uh, i'm sorry to do a preliminary drawing or anything after you're done with the wash lay it flat you don't want the colors to move anymore uh, we're going to let this dry completely and then we will continue working on this uh, if you used accidentally a little bit too much water, you can, let me see, yeah, you can see it on the camera. I'm starting to get a little bit of blossoming. See, I dropped some water here, so I'm getting this, um, a little bit of cauliflower blossom. This is okay. We can cover it up later because we will applying, we will be applying more watercolor on this. But if you're concerned about this, what I would do, just show you a trick that I use sometimes. Um, I would spritz this area with a little bit of water. If, if it dried already, you know, if there's not enough water. And then you can take, I have this uh, big brush, it's soft and uh, it's dry. It needs to be dry, that's the, the main thing. And you can kind of push the pigment where you need it to be especially if you're getting like big puddles this will work as well see I, I have buckling here so paint accumulated so i can kind of gently distribute the pigment and after it dries it will be it will all look nice and smooth if you wanted a very even wash for some reason, if it's necessary for your painting, okay? Do I need to answer a question, Patrick? Nope. No, we're good, okay. I hear Patrick furiously typing, that's why I'm asking if there are any questions. Okay, let's leave this alone and let this dry. And we, meanwhile, can talk about watercolor materials, right? And about other materials that we can use with watercolor. Set this to the side. What brush is that? This I one? the dry brush. This mm -hmm. one is um, um, number 18th mob brush. So let me show you the brand. Here it is. What's the name of the brand? Uh, Tintoretto. It's made in Italy. Uh, you know, this is a great brush, but it holds an enormous amount of water. So I use it only when I paint like on half sheet or full sheet of watercolor paper. I try to use it for smaller formats like this one I'm using is uh, 11 by 14, I believe. That's what I have. Yeah, 10 by 14, so that's too much water. But it's because it's so soft, it's great for kind of moving pigment around if you need to. And I also recommend this uh, guy. This is um, Heiko brush. I use that a lot It's because it's flat. You can also move pigment with it and you, it's good for like wetting watercolor paper and stuff like that. So this is a good one to have. And this one was very inexpensive. All right, so opaque whites. Uh, which opaque whites I use? Basically, it's um, kind of three groups, I would say. 
I will start with my favorites, right? Um, the ones I use the most and the ones I, I will use today. Uh, first of all, it's Artist Gouache. Uh, I use titanium white. That's the whitest white that you can get. Uh, and mine says, you see, it says Artist Gouache. You don't have to get this brand. Uh, this is M. Graham. Uh, that's considered kind of probably the highest quality gouache you can find on the market. I'm sure other manufacturers will not agree, but um, it's very high quality. And why this is my preferred material, I will show you. I have a bunch of artwork that I did using uh, this gouache. Uh, it has Gamma Arabic as binder. And if you know, Gamma Arabic is the binder that watercolors use. So this is one of the paintings. You can't really see the gouache. I, I can see it because I know where it is. So I brought back the highlights on the bowl, on the glass right here. Um, I did some highlights on the strawberries, but it blends with watercolor really well. And it's, um, it's thick, right? So it has really good coverage. That's why I use it quite a bit. I can apply it even on, you see it's very dark area here with watercolor and I can even apply it on this area and it will cover dark colors. And another beauty of this material, here's another example, I, you know, to paint this glass of wine without bringing back those sharp highlights with gouache would be very difficult. I will have to mask them which is a pretty labor intensive uh, process. But with gouache, it just took me a few brush strokes and I was done. Um, here's another example. Uh, the highlight didn't quite work out. And here I applied gouache thinner. So you can thin it out or you can apply it really in pasto. It's very versatile. Uh, use it and you can use it in a a lot of it or just a little bit, right? Like on this puppy, there were just tiny little brush strokes that helped me to show the texture of the fur. Or like on this one, I painted all these petals. I painted with gouache on top of a free flowing watercolor wash, very similar to what we did right now. So I just painted with different colors and then I painted the petals on top of the wash. So that's why I use opaque whites and that's why I think they're very versatile for this technique. And also in this painting, I make, mixed uh, gouache, white gouache with watercolor. I tinted it with watercolor because they have the same binder. They're both water soluble and they both can be reconstituted with water. So once this gouache dries, I can re-wet it and lift it or paint on top of it. It will accept watercolor on top. So that's another great advantage for me because there are other types of gouache. We will talk about them in a second. There's acrylic gouache or acrylic paints and that, will, that technique will not work with those. So you can paint large areas with these colors. Um, here's another example, moving on to portraits. You see the strands of hair on this girl, this is all painted with white gouache. Um, I did a bunch of flowers uh, with that. Again, it doesn't have to be visible. Like on these flowers, I just corrected the very edge of the petal with white gouache. Everything is painted with watercolor and I actually used negative painting on this one, right? I painted everything around these flowers, let it dry. I painted the centers and the shadows on the petals and then I corrected because it's so hard to paint negatively exactly, right? It's kind of hard to switch to painting, to leaving white, you know, what you kind of think that it's not the flower that you're painting, you're painting what's around the flower. So that adjustment is a little hard to do in your brain. Uh, that's why you need something to correct the edges a little bit. And this painting and some other ones are, um, the demonstrations, full demonstrations are in my class, Paint Like the Masters. I love that technique so much that I made a whole class about painting with watercolor in combination with white gouache. So if you're interested in that, I will be 
Um, you can find some information on my website, kaseniainis.com. Uh, I'll show you a couple more examples. I think those flowers turned out pretty nice. So this, um, li these lilacs, difficult subject to paint, right? Because there are so many small details and I can't imagine how much time it will require if you just wanted to paint it with pure watercolor. It will be extremely labor intensive. And this one was done maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half because I used a fake white with it. And here is another example. And here I applied a mixture of gouache and watercolor with a sponge to get that texture on the flowers. Um, this one was interesting kind of as well. I, I really like this painting. Uh, this is applied with a cotton ball <laughs> because it's a cotton plant, right? So I was able to get the texture. And it, it's another example that gouache is has enough coverage to show even dark colors. See how intense that purple is and also the stems are very dark, but it's enough to, you know, it's no problem to paint white on top of this. And how do you paint this with only watercolor? I don't know. Uh, you'll have to somehow work very carefully around this, um, uh, this, this cotton, what are they called? The, the fruit of the cotton plant, cotton balls. Um, and create that soft texture with water. So it will be very tricky, but this was very easy to do with um, opaque white. Sarah Bradley has a question. Uh, sure. Is it tricky to determine the right consistency of the gouache when adding to the watercolors that have been put on the paper? Uh, basically, I use gouache in, um, I would say three consistencies. So when it comes out of the tube, let me show you guys actually, that's an excellent question. So when gouache comes out of the tube, it's, I only use uh, fresh gouache, right? It's very important not to squeeze it out in advance if you plan on using with gouache and pasto. So you need some fresh paint. It's, you can reconstitute it with water if it's artist gouache, if it has gum arabic or dextrin. Dextrin is potato starch. Some paints, um, Royal Talons, I think, produces uh, gouache that uses a potato starch as binder. You can reconstitute it as well, but it's not going to be this, right? Because you will be introducing water into the mixture. So I have a piece of paper here. I was doing some swatches and we'll use this so you can see the white. And another important tip guys, clean water, right? If you're working with white, it's important to have clean water. So when you squeeze it straight out of the tube, it's very viscous. If you can see it on the screen and you get that nice coverage. And if you don't have enough water on the brush, you will even get kind of dry brushed effects. So this is one consistency. The brush is wet, there is no water in gouache, and it's, um, it's fresh and viscous. The second consistency I use is when you need to draw like lines uh, with it, or um, if you mix it with watercolor to tint it. So this will be another story. I would wet the brush, and I would also add a little bit of clean water <laughs> into the into the gouache and that way it uh, becomes a little bit more transparent but it's also easier to spread so you can go over like make longer lines or cover larger areas and then the third consistency that I use is I will dilute it with water a lot and I will sprinkle it and I just love this I maybe even use it too often because I like it so much but this kind of gives painting air I would say like brings back that light especially if you're painting uh, flowers or something like that or a landscape sometimes the background becomes too heavy and if you sprinkle just a little bit of that diluted gouache on the background just gives it texture and like dappled sunlight or something like that so this is a great way um, to use um, gouache as well. On this painting, I will show you guys. See this? These are like 
lemon slices in whiskey or something like that. The, the reference photo as far as I could tell. But I sprinkled some gouache to paint the, the bubbles in the, in the background. And uh, that was the only way I could think of to do this. And then I spritzed them with water and I kind of tilted the painting and they ran and softened. So they're not super opaque, but they give your painting that kind of finished look, that texture, and also kind of shows that those lemon slices are not in um, sitting on a countertop or something like that, right? But they're floating in, in liquid. All right, so this is one material that I wanted to show you. And another great favorite of mine is Dr. Page Martin's Pen White Ink. This is opaque white ink that I use a lot. It's very similar to gouache. You can also re-wet it and lift it if you made a mistake or you changed your mind or something like that. Uh, but it's different in the way that gouache kind of sits on top of your paper. And um, if you look closely, you can see gouache. But uh, ink kind of soaks into the paper fibers and it's almost like you restore the white of the paper. So it looks a little bit different. And if I usually use ink for larger areas, if you're painting, 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 and they're like, oh no, I should have left this white. Then I go to my ink bottle and I um, repaint this area. And again, if I need to, I can paint watercolor on top of that area that I painted with ink. Okay, so that's a great advantage that we always need to keep in mind. Um, let me see if I have some examples. I think this fish, I used inks for those. <clears throat> it's, it's hard to tell guys, uh, gouache and ink will look very similar, but I believe I added this, um, corrected the edges on this fish with ink, if I'm not mistaken. And let me, <clears throat> I'll show you, I'll actually use ink to finish our painting. So you will see it in action in just a minute. Um, I wanted to mention also material that's called um, Chinese white, right? Opaque white that sometimes comes with watercolor paints. It's fine to use if you have it in your set, it will work. Um, it's not as opaque as gouache or ink, so it will have some transparency. It's actually used to mix with different colors of watercolor, uh, so it's not super heavy or opaque. But if you need to add like a little highlight or some hair on a dog or something like that, this will work fine as well. All right. Um, the next group of materials I wanted to talk about is all kinds of liner tools. I was, I kind of thought they were for sketching, so I use them with watercolor, but after I tried them, I actually discovered that they give you liner tools like white pencils and all kinds of markers, white markers. They actually give you good control, right? So they're great for small details. They might not have the same coverage as gouache and ink, obviously, um, but they have their own place. So choosing what to use will depend on your subject, obviously, on your technique um, and the area that you need to introduce white into. So keep this in mind. Um, don't dismiss them because, you know, it's a different material. Uh, Speaking of art shows, you know, if you're entering your painting into an art show, if a material, if you introduced another material, but it's less than 10% of your painting square footage, so to say, of the painting area, you don't have to mention it. It's not considered mixed media. So let me show you some practical applications. So this is um, a water-based Sharpie. It's pretty thick, but I think you can find it in thinner versions as well. Uh, if you see, it's not as a, it's kind of like diluted gouache in opacity, 
but you can go over certain areas a couple times and um, you know apply it again or maybe you don't need complete opacity maybe you just want to lighten certain areas that will be a good way to use it as well this is Posca marker this is actually acrylic so you have to be careful with that I'll tell you why in a second but and it also dries so I don't use mine often enough so it dried a little bit but it's got a brush on the end so it has it's you know very easy to use and it's portable also if you're going on location somewhere uh, this will be a, a material to consider and I recently started using white pencils if you have a set of just regular color pencils like I have this Prismacolor I specifically bought a big set and see how short my white is because I started using it especially for flowers when you just need to correct the edges very small areas and you don't want them to be noticeable this is a great tool again doesn't have huge coverage it's not perfect coverage but it's good to use for very fine lines and of course it's very easy to control much easier than a brush right when you have to be really precise so for lines all these tools will be a good option. Kathy Williams has a question. Sure. Um, watercolor or chalk pencils? Um, these are colored pencils, soft core color pencils by Prismacolor. I originally asked what kind of enchiladas and made me hungry. <laughs> enchiladas? No, enchiladas today. Um, this one is their vent. It's also called Color Soft. So I just went to the art supply store and you know they have all this I think it's just regular color pencils for color pencil art and I picked the ones that said color soft because I want them to be soft uh, and not kind of leave an imprint on my paper but to just you know leave nice uh, shaded area. So, Diane wants to know if the white pencil is better than pastel pencil. Um, You can use pastels uh, I was going to kind of suggest oil pastels is an interesting tool to introduce. They always come with white. I have also these Dervent art bars. They have a lot of light colors, including white. Uh, keep in mind with chalks, pastels, all kind of kind of chalk based materials. First of all, the surface is going to be a little bit larger, so you will not have quite as much control as with a pencil like this, right? I can sharpen this to a very fine point, but with pastels, I guess you can sharpen it on um, uh, sandpaper, uh, but it will be very soft, it will be thicker, and that you will have to work with. Also, it will leave texture because you're working on watercolor paper you know it's very textured so it will leave texture on your paper you will have to use a q-tip or um, uh, those little tortillons I actually bought them yesterday to to blend it right so that it will look um, as one with your watercolor painting and then if you don't spray them with fixative they will transfer you know you can smudge them or they will transfer on another sheet of paper if you put something on top so just those technical um, considerations to keep in mind uh, but you know all these materials all these line tools will work great with watercolor it's not a problem you don't have to have special paper or do anything special you can you know safely apply them on top of watercolor any more questions about line tools? We're good? That's it for now. Okay, let me show you a couple of examples, guys. Um, I have them right here. So, some of you see in this painting, or maybe even painted it with me. Um, I used white gouache here, but something like this, like see those branches on the trees? That's what I was talking about when a liner tool will be actually really good to use. And this is actually splattering. See how much I splattered here? I was talking about splattering. Um, so trees, maybe like architectural details, uh, 
brush will be especially if you're painting on a smaller format brush will be hard to use because you just don't kind of have the resolution right the brush will be too large so a pencil will be great for this and this is an example where i used posca markers these ones so i painted this very loose watercolor wash then i added black with a marker with a brush tip marker and then i added white with the same marker you can see it's kind of it kind of sits on top so you can see it but i mean it works i think it works great for these purposes for quick sketches especially and this is another example this is watercolor and black and white posca marker and all all these videos are on my youtube channel so if you're interested how they painted you can see it there this ballerina is uh, this one was actually this marker so i used i painted her with watercolors with uh, moon glow and indigo from daniel smith and then of course i had to bring back all those details so i used sharpie and it's interesting because it kind of mixed with watercolor in some areas so i got this additional shading which i think worked really well with her with her tutu and everything and I wanted to show you this example. This is a watercolor with oil pastels. Something in this era of family. Um, you see how textured they are? So pastels will give you a slightly different look. So you need to keep that in mind. So this will definitely look more like mixed media. So which well, not a bad thing, you know, if, if that's what, what you're going for. Beth said that you were going to say something about acrylic and watercolor that we need to mind. Uh, sure, I'm getting to that. Give me just a second. Um, another example, watercolor and pencils. White and also color pencils. So I used light green to draw the veins on the leaves. So this will be another option for you. If you buy a set of watercolor paper of um, just regular color pencils, right? You don't have to use just white. You can use all the colors that you have for your florals or whatever you're working on. This was, is, is another example. See all these areas were painted with or drawn with white pencil. And I also used some color pencils in the flowers to add some details. But because it's watercolor paper, see the texture? so it comes out very textured and this is another example so i drew all these little wispy details on these um, dry um, thistles with white pencil but that's when my white pencil started to disappear really quick and I had to go buy another one because this is 300 pound paper it's textured it's very you know super textured and it was just eating that pencil really quick I had to constantly sharpen it to finish the the painting and but I mean it's they're not super expensive you can buy one separately all right another group of whites that we need to talk about are uh, acrylic based whites um, these would be uh, obviously just the regular acrylic paint this is titanium white as well and these will be a group of um, gouache that is called acrylic gouache and what is acrylic gouache it's this except they took the shine out of it so it's matte acrylic paint and this uh, materials have good coverage uh, titanium white will be as white as um, the other materials that I showed you the problem is that once you apply them that's it right we all know if you ever tried acrylic paint it dries and it forms a film and it sits there and you can't move it anymore so um, you know you need to be sure that you're applying those highlights where they're supposed to be because you will not be able to change them and also if you wanted to paint watercolor on top of them watercolor will puddle right you will not be able to easily cover those areas with uh, paint if you change your mind 
and I've never tried mixing this with watercolor I don't know if it will work so I kind of think sticking to the same family will be better for watercolor painting so these are fine to use if it's just a small area and you don't have anything else but you need to kind of know how they behave and what is the problem of using them and also if you leave these on your watercolor brushes they will uh, you know the bristles will all stick together it will be very hard to clean them and you might even ruin the brushes if it's a natural fibers brush uh, so I would use a separate set of brushes for this acrylic based materials all right I hope I answered that question all right guys I think enough time passed to when our painting dried so we will continue painting and finish our painting today or you can continue watching and finish later if you want to I'm trying to get organized here I'm going to open my colors again I will still need them um I kind of I wasn't sure if my painting will dry and it's still I will show you it's still slightly warped which tells me it's not completely dry and also when I touch it it feels cool so even though there is no sheen or no shine and no sheen the surface is dry but the temperature and the buckling tells me that it's not completely dry so I will pull the rabbit out of the head and I have have another one <laughs> that I painted in advance this is guys a 300 pound paper and I wanted to do this also to show you the difference in color intensity I know this thick watercolor paper is very expensive and but I mean you get what you pay for because it's colors are brighter it's easier to work on it and see how on this one on um, 140 pound I barely get any texture but on this one I get this kind of it just looks like watercolor it's kind of velvety texture that um, the paper helps me create um, I'm not saying that you need to absolutely use this but just keep in mind that if you want to have brighter colors and at least try it you know just buy a small uh, block maybe of it and just give it a try I highly recommend it okay so let's continue painting I'm going to set up my painting at an angle again I have a quick question sure Beth uh, wants to know if you can use watercolor brushes when applying ink I use watercolor brushes yeah I'll show you in just one second what I'm going to do um here's my ink I have this little ceramic containers they come like a whole set with a lid it's a type of palette so that's what I like to use but you can just use whatever a little dish or a cup or something like that and I like to put the ink in a separate uh, container so I don't poke my brush in it and you know make it all dirty so that's why I do this but before we start with watercolor you know we didn't do a drawing we just kind of went with the flow um, so I need to figure out where things are going to be and what I'm going to do I think I had it on the list of materials right so I'm going to use uh, dry pastels speaking of pastels we're going to use them for this painting and don't look at this brand guys this is ancient it says made in Czechoslovakia so you can imagine how long ago I bought <laughs> this one so any dry pastels will work and this is what I'm going to use to draw and kind of figure out where exactly all my lemon and orange slices are going to be I don't want to introduce graphite pencil right because then you will see the lines and you will have to do something with all these lines but pastel you know color can be part of my painting so let's get started one this one will be somewhere here if you don't have pastels but you have watercolor pencils or something like that ready go ahead and use those even 
I think oil pastels will actually work very well for this too. So um, you don't necessarily have to use exact same materials as I do. So this will be one, then there will be another one here. Let's see guys, I think, did I do it? Yeah, I did it right. <laughs> you can do it many different ways. I think I got it confused. Yeah, I think I wanted, now this, yeah, this is the top one. So this is the top one and this is this one. I can turn this over, I guess. Sorry guys, I'm con probably confusing you, but this painting doesn't have top and bottom, <laughs> so we can work in any direction. Uh, Sarah wants to know if there is only one layer of watercolor on the second dry piece that you pulled out. Um, well, yes, because it was wet and I applied colors, but then I kind of thought that I added too much water to some of them. So I picked up some more pigment and I kind of dropped it into that wet wash, but I didn't wait for it to dry or anything like that. It was all wet and I just piled the pigment on top of the paper. And because the paper is so thick, the pigment kind of sink, sinks into it. They call it thirsty paper, you know, that 300 pound paper. Uh, so it can accept a lot more pigment with basically no warping and with no deterioration. With 140 pound, you have to be a little more delicate because you know, if you oversaturate it with water, you will just start getting puddles because there is nowhere for paint to go. So you will just have the splotches of water on, on the surface. So that's another reason why this is so much more intense than the first one. But I'm not saying that this is the way you're supposed to paint, right? If you're into those light kind of airy, delicate watercolors, 140 pound will be perfect, you know, because um, it does not require quite as much water and pigment. Okay, there is this guy here. Kathy wants to know if you're going to dust off the pastels after the painting. Yeah, definitely. I, I will need to blend them a little bit and I will need to get rid of the shavings. And again, I'm kind of working very loosely. I'm following the reference photo, but I'm not super, you know, what's going to happen if this lemon slice is in the wrong spot or different shape or size, right? Nothing's going to happen. So don't get too concerned about perfection and doing everything exactly right. That's not our goal today. We just start to have some fun and play with our colors and our materials. I'm going to switch to an orange just for varieties because I have different colors. If you have maybe like bright pink or something like that, that you can use that or red maybe. This will be good as well. Let's see, this one is very light. Maybe we'll even use like white pastel. just for fun. It's a big slice. Let's see. And notice guys that I'm trying not to draw like circles like this. For some reason it never looks good. So I'm working with kind of straight, a little bit straight line here, like with sections of a line, because that makes it easier to control the line. And also it ends up looking a lot better on the finished painting. There's a something here. I think that's enough. So I have them all distributed and now it is time to finally get to our opaque whites. What we can do, we can also do this. I have a Q-tip right here. If you get a lot of texture and you don't want the texture, it's very easy to get rid of. Can smooth it out a little bit. Are you guys painting with me? Is anybody painting? I'm just curious to know. Let me know also in the chat. Just 
just a quick smooth go through all these okay this looks good so we achieved two things here right we know where all our lemon slices are going to be orange slices and we kind of started working on those highlighted areas right we gave kind of started on the on restoring those lighter areas in the painting shake this off let me see yeah i'm not going to use a brush it's not a lot of chalk that you get but you get a little bit all right and let's get some ink you can use gouache if you have some you can use pencils Ink sometimes thickens, guys. Keep that in mind. I will need something to stir it. I'll use a little brush. Diane, Cheryl, Beth, and Sarah are all painting. And Kathy. Oh, cool. Okay, we have some people who are painting at the same time. That's cool. All right, let's put some on the dish just to prevent the contamination. And I'm going to use my dagger brush for this. I will show you guys my favorite brush. I even wore out the tip on it. I already bought a new one, but I think this one will still work for this painting. So this brush, this is um, Royal and Langnickel uh, quarter inch dagger brush. I highly recommend it. There are many other brands that you can find this shape in. Uh, and it's very versatile because I can use it in two ways. I can use it flat to paint larger areas where I can turn it on the side and paint uh, finer lines with it. And I find it a lot easier. I have a um, liner brush as well, but see how much longer this is? So this is a lot harder to control than this. Also this one for some reason won't stay together. It's all hairy, so it's, harder to get the fine point on this one but this really stays together very well um oh, here is the new one actually i bought let me show you see how uh fine the tip was and because of watercolor paper right of all the texture i kind of wore it out but i'll switch to the new one in a little bit i think this one is still fine again clean water do not contaminate your white with that water that you used for washing your brush for the first layer. And we can start painting with our central um, lemon. So the center will be somewhere here and then this will be the rind. And I'm doing the same thing here. I'm not doing a circle, right, because that will be very hard to do. I'm going a little bit in sections. So go around and apply all this opaque white. And then we can do the, the slices, right? Here I'm, so I used the wider side of the brush and now I'm turning it to the edge and I'm connecting all the all these areas with the center we will go back to watercolor in just a second guys i want to show you something else what we can do to this painting and again this is all very free i'm kind of looking at the reference photo but the lemons are not going to be hurt if you don't paint them exactly as they are in the reference photo so don't worry about it just have fun and paint whatever you feel like painting okay and let's do these ones as well go around so with the ink I did not, I wet the brush as you saw, but I did not really introduce any 
color uh, any water i'm sorry into it because i obviously want good coverage but if yours thickened quite a bit maybe or you want a little bit less transparency if you look at some of these slices the rind is not pure white so we might want to reduce opacity in some of them and so the watercolor will peek through and kind of we will get a little bit of variation in in color right and intensity of white all right are we all on the same page guys no more questions or anything like that oh no uh, okay. Jeanette said she's painting okay good and if you guys post your paintings on social media make sure you tag me tag Tamirab Studio. Tamirab has two B's in it. Or just tag Ksenia Anis. So I will see um, the results, you know, what, what you painted. I would love to see the, the finished paintings from the session. Okay, let's find the center on this one. It will be here somewhere. And Let's try diluting. I will dip the brush in water and maybe try diluting the ink a little bit. So let watercolor kind of peek through a little bit on this one because it's kind of, you know, in shadow. So we might as well you know have a little bit of variation is always good we always talk about visual interest right in our painting we don't want it to be all the same and boring so visual interest is always always good i feel like this one i need to see i need to find the center because i kind of changed the reference photo a little bit so we will paint the center and then we will paint the the rind i'm thinning out my ink it's been i had this bottle for quite a while it actually lasts quite a long time because you don't need much um so it thickened and i'm diluting it a little bit with with water all right so we will so this is what we're going to do and you know you would finish this ones as well i want to show you something else guys um it's been an hour and i don't want to keep you here forever and ever um you see how in the reference photo these areas are very dark so i would you know in watercolor we work with layers um we kind of reversed it a little bit we're supposed to start with light then work to mid-tone and to dark we applied our mid-tone basically we added our lightest areas but we still need to add the darkest areas and i'm going to do that last and what i'm going to do is just take small brush this dagger brush will still work perfectly well and i will take some um, color straight out of the well without diluting it and i will add all these small details and you will see how much difference it will make so there is a little shadow here in the center. We can darken some of these areas. You see how this immediately started looking more realistic, right? It just popped right away. Maybe add some color here. And if you touch uh, pastels with watercolor, the chalk will melt, but the pigment will remain. So don't worry about it. You can work with watercolor if it's uh, soft pastels. You can go over them with watercolor again with no problem. Um, oil pastels will work as a resistance. So as a resist, so you will not be able to apply watercolor on top of it. But that can be interesting as well. And darken these areas even more so our painting kind of quickly becomes a lot more 
three dimensional and looks just a lot more finished, right? Dark area here. A little shadow on this one. Question? What brand are your dagger brushes? It's Royal and Langnickel. Royal and Langnickel. Okay. Hand me one. Let's add a little bit of texture to this one as well. Um, when you start kind of making corrections, uh, it's important to not overdo this because you don't want to ruin this nice kind of initial wash that you got. But if you want to darken one side maybe or something like that, that's perfectly fine. All right, so we're darkening certain areas. We're adding some texture in some spots. You see how I, you know, I pushed uh, some areas back and that what gave volume to my watercolor. All right, so this is how we will finish this painting. Let's see, I need a shadow right here. And there will be maybe center here as well. And I will, after I do the whites on this one, I would add, you know, little shadows on these guys as well. And let me show you, if I wanted to soften this and kind of, I can paint on top of soft pastels as well. I've been loving this technique lately. I've been using it in quite a few of my paintings. You can see them on my YouTube channel. Um, it's just, you know, really works with watercolor using, combining watercolor and soft pastels. Okay. So I think you get a good idea of what we're trying to do here. I don't want to uh, take up all your morning today. I know it's Saturday. You probably have a lot of things to do. But this is basically the technique that I wanted to show you today. Uh, any pressing questions or anything, I'll go through all the comments uh, later and answer if I didn't answer right away. Um, check out my website, um, kaseniaines.com. I have classes for beginner watercolors there. I have a class on this technique on all those flowers that I showed you. You will all get a special offer on those two classes on that package. Um, and I thank you for watching. You've, are we good, Patrick? Yes, um, we have some questions. Okay, well, let's take a few more questions and then we'll wrap up and it will give you a chance to work on the painting some more. Okay. First of all, Cheryl wants to know what color you used for the shadows. Uh, this is Sinilia Permanent, Magenta Permanent. And Kathy wants to know if you paint on top of the pastels, do you still need to use the fixative? Um. I mean, I would uh, use a fixative in any case if you're um, if you plan to display your painting in um, in a frame under glass. You know the pastels will be fine, but if you just store your painting and then maybe you want to sell them later or something like that, you will either have to put uh, like little just white paper or something like that, like parchment paper between. Uh, just to preserve them, you know, you don't want to smudge your work accidentally uh, because they will still transfer to some extent. Okay. That's all the questions so far. Alrighty. Well, that was fun. I hope you had fun too, guys. I hope you learned something new. Thank you so much for being with me today here. 
it, this um, live event. Uh, our plan is to do something live every month. So hopefully if you subscribe to the channel, you will get notifications or you can follow me on social media. You know, you, it's easy to find me. So thank you all so much and we'll see you next time here on Tamarup Studios channel.